If you could please turn with me to 1 Peter, chapter 1. And let me begin with asking you a question. Let me begin by asking this question for you, if, to you, and I'd like you to sit with this question. What is the most sure or real thing on this earth for you? Such a big question, right? What is the most sure or real thing on this earth for you? It's pretty deep. And as you've probably experienced, the only things worth pursuing are pretty deep things. And the things that we contend with here and we struggle here, here and we receive here because of the word of God are pretty deep things and oftentimes existential things and sometimes it goes into the realm of philosophy sometimes, but it always comes back to who God is and who you are relating to him. And so this question is no different. What is the most sure or real thing on this earth for you? People are seeking answers for something that is sure and real today. There are many things in this life that we believe to be sure and lasting, and they are not. For example, I mean, some people think the relationships last. Think of all the relationships that you have. Throw marriage in there. Look at all the statistics. Look at all of how fragile our relationships are actually are. You can have strong feelings about a relationship one day and, and you have rocky relationships the next. It doesn't last. Think about success and our pursuit of success and the moment that you reach it, wow, how deflating. It's only so short-lived and that you have to create another goal in life where you're seeking and defining that success and clinging on to that success. Think about money. <laughs> and a lot of people are chasing after money and thinking that if they have enough of it, it will last. For the majority of us, yeah, that's, uh, that's not the case. We don't have enough, and that's okay. God is enough. Amen. Think about time. We're running out of it. You don't have forever. Actually, you've got a limited of time, and we're chasing after time, or we're thinking in, the, in our younger years that we've got plenty of time. But you, you never know what life will throw at you and when you will go and when your time ends. Think about life itself. Think about endings. All lives. All lives have a time limit, and they come to an end. Sometimes we think about earth as being lasting, that rocks, I mean, th these things will never go away, right? This dirt will never go away, that this is the most lasting thing. But we learn that everything fades. Nothing found on this earth will last and that's the reality of it. Reality of it. Everything has a shelf life. And Bill Krager was actually just talking about this. The moment we're kind of putting our, we're contending about issues of, of today, of politics, and then we realize four, six, eight years later, why did we give up relationships for those things? Everything has a shelf life, an expiration date. Deep down, the inner man is longing for something that lasts. And they want to be part of it. They want to find what that is and hook onto it. In other words, we're longing for eternity. We're longing for forever, for something lasting. And it's like a Jenga tower. You guys ever played Jenga before? You stack those br little bricks, right? 
and you take one out and it starts to kind of teeter. This life is like very loose and shaky. As this life goes on, everything around us is, un- is sure to collapse and not last. And I suppose that's one thing that we can count on happening. All things fall- falling apart and all things <laughs> not lasting. You know, there's an existing race and pursuit of the per- preservation of the human race or humanity, right? Uh, through means such as health sciences, uh, because they're motivated by the longing for eternity. Pursuits in areas such as cures for cancer and longevity through diet and exercise. Also, preservation through sp- space exploration, um, and the goal of living on Mars, like Elon Musk. Some people have put their, their hope on the seemingly sure achievements and smarts and intelligence of humans, as if this is what's going to save us all. But I think, and I believe, that if you want to put your trust on something that is sure and more real than the air you breathe right now, then look no further than what's in front of you. Right here. Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, it says this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The word, Yeshua, who was at the beginning of all things and made the heavens and the earth declares that his words will not pass away. Think about that statement. He's saying his words will outlast time. His words and he himself are moving, are more real than anything we put our trust in on this earth. What are you most sure or confident in? What is the most real thing to you? Let me read our passage for today. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 to 5, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua Messiah who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua, Messiah, from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter, with these verses, isn't trying to convince believers who already believe. This is written as a praise to God for his greatness and loving kindness. That's what it sounds like, right? Peter is confirming and stating the facts of the surest and most real thing that they can put their trust in. In these verses, he's not addressing doubts. He is giving them more reasons to be hopeful and remain in an attitude of worship and thankfulness for the trust on whom they have placed. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to to receive your truth today. And I pray, Lord, that these words would just be an encouragement to us and help us contend with this question today. In Yeshua's name, amen. Let me go back for a moment. And, you know, last week... I. I missed an opportunity to, to point out something, and it's a, another opportunity again, and so I, I wanted to kind of backtrack for just a moment. In verses 1 and 2, 
at the very beginning of this letter, we see the evidence and just the premise of Peter here, stating the most, some of the obvious things to him of the triune nature of God. He speaks about the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in these verses. If I can go back, he says this, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua, Messiah, to those who reside as aliens scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, one, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, two, to obey Yeshua, Messiah, and be sprinkled with his blood, three. I got so caught up with all the other things that I just wanted to reference that as we look at these next three verses as he talks about just this assumption that we have and we take for granted but people stumble upon of just our God and the relationship between God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and the three persons and how they are connected eternally, relationally, and forever. And so just in the back of your minds, pay attention to those in these verses today and even throughout this letter. So what are they trusting in specifically? I just asked you that question. What do you trust in the most on this earth? What are they, the hearers, trusting in specifically. This is what Peter says. They are trusting in God's mercy, one. They are trusting that they are born again into a living hope, two. They are trusting that they trust in the inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade, three. And lastly, they trust that their inheritance is reserved for them in heaven, four. In just these three verses, we find that out. So let's take a look at that. They trust in God's mercy according to his great mercy. That's what Peter says. His mercy is the motive for giving us eternal life through his son. His mercy is the motive, the motivation for giving us eternal life through his son. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, it says this, but God, being rich in mercy, rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Messiah. By grace, you have been saved. Mercy is the outcome of God's character. And he is merciful to our position of being spiritually dead in our sin. Mercy is not the same as grace. That's why we have two two different words. But mercy concerns an individual's miserable condition. And grace concerns his guilt, which which causes the condition. God's mercy takes a sinner from misery to glory, which is a change in condition, while God's grace takes him from guilt to acquittal, which is a change in position. Both mercy and grace from God is the answer to the human longing. It's what we were made to receive through trusting and putting our faith in God. Believers are to fully trust in the mercy of God to give us eternal life. And that was the premise in which Peter is writing here. That first trust, to trust in God's mercy because he's, that's who he is. And thank God he is. Secondly, that they, are to tr- they, that they are to trust that they are born again into a living hope. Peter uses the term born again as we First read, when we read John chapter 3, as Yeshua is speaking to Nicodemus, he uses that term born again. But essentially, you have become 
children of God. In John 1, 12, 13, it says this, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Peter is declaring that being born again, or regeneration, results in receiving a living hope. I remember my last year in Bible college in Israel. We took a class. It was an archaeological a class on archaeology. There we go. That's, that's a better way to phrase it. We go down into the Negev. We go to Tel Tamar. We start digging. We help this archaeologist um, uncover. Um, <laughs> essentially, it was a garbage dump is what we were digging into. We were finding all kinds of Nabataean um, pottery, shards here and there. Nothing of really significance other than you've got thousands Hundreds and thousands of that stuff everywhere. Um, watch out for the Arabs. They might sell you on stuff. Um, but anyway, they, um, we were just digging, digging, digging. We found um, some pretty cool things like discovering um, uh, what they, they thought was, a, was an aqueduct right there. And uh, we got to dig into it and, and find it and uncover it and confirm it. And that was, that was uh, a highlight of that, of that trip. But um, the, the archaeologist, uh, one day, right in the middle of that week, as we were digging, he's like, you know, let's take a break. I, I want to show you something. So we go on a hike. He takes us further into the Negev, out into the desert, and it's just barren. There's hills, there's mountains, but there was literally nothing growing in that. And I, I take off my shoes and, and I, I walk. At, look, I, I'm a Hawaiian by heart, and so I, I, I like to be barefooted. And so, you know, I'm, I'm walking in this hot sand, and it's like, it's just, I'm like, there's nothing, literally nothing growing in this desert. And if there's any hope for this desert to be revived, it has to come from somewhere outside to really pour all kinds of resources for it to thrive. There's nothing that's going to grow here on its own. It was dead. It was completely dead. This world only knows of dying hopes. When you put your hope on things on this earth, it's going to die. Hopes that fade and hopes that result in nothing. But believers have a living and undying hope that will be fulfilled. Peter speaks of this in his second letter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, it says, But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And God provides that. Let me talk about our living hope for a little bit more. Our living hope has brought salvation. In Romans 8, 22 to 25, it says this, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffer the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly eagerly for it. Our living hope has brought out salvation for us. 
And secondly, our living hope purifies us through Messiah. It says this in 1 John, as he writes in chapter 3, verse 2 to 3. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet that yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Our hope in Messiah, this living hope, purifies us. And also this hope, our living hope, extends beyond this earth into righting all the wrongs and bringing about the dominion of Messiah and the resurrection from the dead. And Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19 to 26. Let's read it. It says, if we have hoped, listen, listen, to, listen carefully to what he writes. If we have hoped in Messiah in this life only, we are of all men to be pitied. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. Let me stop right there. That phrase, but now Messiah has been raised from the dead. What hope is that? That's hope beyond life on this earth. That's what he's talking about. And if we only stop with hope that's here on this earth, he's saying you are to be pitied. And we should. Because there's so much more of this living hope. Let's read on. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Messiah the first fruits, after that those who are Messiahs at his coming. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and, all, and, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Believers trust you and I must trust that they are born again. We have died and we have a new life in Messiah and we truly have a living hope in Messiah, Yeshua. Thirdly, Peter's talking about that they ought to trust in this inheritance, this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade. The word inheritance is, is this wealth, right? Or a legacy that's being passed down that one receives as a family member. This wealth we are, we are being given is not junk, is what he's saying. It's not junk. It doesn't fade like the treasures of this world. Going back to that question one more time. What on this earth is the most real or sure thing that you can think of. And this inheritance waiting for us is infinitely more valuable than anything we find here on this earth. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it says, And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Messiah. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And also in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys 
and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Therefore, our inheritance is heaven. Our inheritance is eternity. And our inheritance is to be glorified with Messiah, according to these verses. Believers must trust in their inheritance as a family member of God. Do you believe that? You've become a family of God. And you've got an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. Which leads us to our fourth. And it says this, that they are to trust that their inheritance is reserved in heaven. Let me read that, starting in verse 4, the final part. It says this, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through a faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's break it down for just a moment. Reserved, what does that mean? Reserved meaning to guard or to watch over, which means our inheritance is divinely guarded. It's not going away. This speaks of an inheritance that's already present, that's there, waiting and guarded, secure in heaven. That's what it's saying. Not only do we have an inheritance that is, that is served for us and waiting for us, but those who possess it are protected by God. That's what this verse is saying. Let me quote, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So those who possess this inheritance are protected by God from any who would try to separate us from our inheritance. That's the encouraging word from Peter. So for those of you who identify as heirs, as family members, you have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven, and it's already there, guarded by God. And he is protecting you on this earth. So for those that would try to separate you from that, would not separate you. And I want to show you a passage from Paul who speaks beautifully about this, concerning this inheritance, concerning of those who would try to separate you from that inheritance. Listen and be encouraged in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 39. It says this, what then shall we say these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Messiah Yeshua is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Messiah? Will tribulation? Will distress? Will persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. Believers are to 
trust in the inheritance that is being guarded in heaven and our God who protects us from all things that would try to separate us from that inheritance. I pray that your hope is fully in Messiah today. There's nothing else on this earth to place your hope in. It is a dying hope. There is nothing more sure, nothing more real than the promises of God and the work of Messiah, who gave his life that we might live as children of God. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much, Lord, for the truth that was just read today, written by Peter. Thank you so much. You are to be glorified and honored and magnified. And we thank you and we love you. Thank you for your promises. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you for the hope, the living hope that we have put and that we have placed in you. There is no other hope, Lord, here on earth. You have provided a way and we are grateful. And I pray, Lord, that our attitude will continue to be one of thankfulness and of worship because you are worthy to be praised. In Yeshua's name, amen. Let's all stand.